Greetings, everyone. This is Eric Stewart from Fishing Fanatics. And today I have an awesome guest, uh, Tim Minich. Tim is a passionate, passionate fisherman and hunter, and he started fly fishing when he was just five years old. And he's been archery and deer hunting for the past 44 years. Tim was inspired to develop a completely different type of camouflage based upon the science behind deer vision, which we'll jump into a little bit during this podcast and also how he developed his company, Whitetail Forensics. So how are you doing, Tim? I'm doing great, Eric. I uh, appreciate having, having me on the, on this evening. I uh, was looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. And you're right. You definitely focused on two of my passions in terms of uh, fishing and hunting. And there never seems to be enough time to do do it as much as you want. That's for sure. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? I was just, um, I was so happy because this last Sunday by us, we finally got the first decent day to go fishing. And it was just so nice to get back out there and get back in a little bit. Yeah, I have uh, one of my youth field representatives uh, for our WTF camo. He also started his own uh, fishing bait company at, at age 15. Well, actually, he was 13 when he started it uh, during COVID. So he decided he was going to start making his own fishing baits, and he got molds and everything, and he makes his own plastics. And we're actually going to start carrying them on our website to kind of get him going. Um, he calls himself Let's Go Fishing um, Baits. And uh, mm -hmm. the reason I'm bringing it up is he already sent me some pictures of some smallies he's catching uh, on the Susquehanna and such. So it's, 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 he's out there a little bit ahead of me, but he's, he's out having some success already. No, that's awesome. Um, definitely we'll drop that in the description for anyone to go check out um, the, you know, all of his content too. And feel free to send me over those pictures too at the end of this podcast and we'll put sure, them up we'll on have. Facebook and all that good okay. stuff. But I know we met at the Great American Outdoor Show, which is an awesome time. Um, tell us a little bit about the experience at the Great American Outdoor Show, because I just want to give a shout out to all those people that kind of put that on. Yeah, sure. Um, actually, this was my second year exhibiting. Uh, I launched our WTF Camo brand. By the way, for folks, it's the company's Whitetail Forensics, which is where the WTF Camo comes from. You can imagine the comments we get at the booth about that, uh, especially from the good old Central Pennsylvania crowd. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yeah, this was my second year exhibiting, and it, it you know the weekends can be a little overwhelming. I believe uh, 2021 or 2022 was 180,000 people. And I believe they went over 200,000 people this year. So, you know, as you know, it's the largest, largest outdoor show uh, in, in the country, if not the world. And uh, it's a lot of fun, though. It gets me a lot of great people. You know, met you for the first time and uh, have an opportunity to uh, share ideas and learn about what other people are doing. And unfortunately, as, as an exhibitor, I don't really get to walk around. I, I only get to go walk around a little bit before the show opens. And hope to catch some people in the booth to talk to, but you know I don't get to see much of the show because I'm I'm in the booth the entire time. But it was it was it was a good time. It's a nine day grind. There's no doubt about it. Being Definitely. in the booth for nine days that that's quite the grind. But uh, it was it was a lot of fun, and I had a lot of uh, friends and my field reps helping me out, and well, that made it go a lot 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 better uh, having that kind of help. Definitely, I think it's cool too the community of just straight like outdoors people, whether it's deer hunting, whether it's just people that are gun enthusiasts, whether it's fishermen, everyone kind of comes together in this one central place and everyone's passionate about the same thing and it's outdoors. And it's just great yeah. to see. And it's, it's sad you kind of can't walk around a little bit because the, uh, the live seminars there are, are absolutely unbelievable, whether it be the dog shows or um, the other seminars and the fishing shows too, they're, they're pretty cool. Yeah. And it's kind of nice to see, I, I know some people complain that since the NRA took over, they, they feel there's a big uh, focus on shooting sports. And I mean, there were, there was before, but you know, one thing nice since they took over, there's no more ShamWall guy there. <laughs> so there used to be the ShamWall guy and there used to be the bear wrestling. So they got rid of some of the hokey stuff. And I think it's really much more focused on the sport itself, um, fishing, uh, camping, hunting. And uh, I really, I really do appreciate the focus. And a lot of people certainly come just to walk around and look that, that aren't even necessarily much into some of those sports, but um, it, it definitely draws draws a crowd in from Pennsylvania and beyond. And I really drove myself there. Definitely, I remember I was sitting in the parking lot and I got out, and this big camper pulled up, and it was a bunch of guys from West Virginia. And they pulled the cooler out, and they're like, "You want a beer?" I was like, "I gotta go in there and meet people." <laughs> yeah, it's gotta be one of the only outdoor shows where people tailgate. <laughs> yeah, it's like an Eagles game around us, but yeah, it's funny. 
Um, cool, man. So tell me a little bit about the story about Whitetail Forensics, w, uh, WTF, because it's interesting. The type of camo, I've never seen anything like it before. Um, personally, I'm not like a huge deer hunter, but it's just something that's like so out of my league. Tell me a little bit about how you kind of came up with WTF. Yeah, sure. You know, I was at our local Cabela's up in Hamburg and it was up on the second floor in 2013. Dates back that far. I was looking down at the middle of the store where they used to have the camo display. And back then, Cabela's carried a lot of different camo brands before kind of best pro bottom majority spake. And I'm up on the second floor. I'm looking down at the camo about 40, 45 yards away. And it all looked, looked like a dark blob to me. Like I just really couldn't tell the patterns apart. And for the first time ever, I kind of said, hmm, I wonder how a deer actually views that camo. So I uh, tasked my son, Brendan, with kind of researching uh, the science behind deer vision and really looked at, you know, what did deer see? How do they see it? And how do they see things different than us? And what I learned was that I've kind of been wearing the wrong camo really my entire life because uh, deer are red, green, colorblind. But the big thing is their, their vision is 2100. So they don't see detail as well as you and I do if you have 2020 vision. And uh, that that what that means is that all that detail in those kind of real to nature camo patterns blends together to a deer. So all that detail blends together and you kind of get that dark blob effect. It always used to drive me crazy. Why, you know, I could be up in my stand, perfectly still, wind is in my favor, and a doe walks in, just looks straight up at me, and then off she goes. And we, we, we did that research, and then my son, Brendan, who's the designer, uh, he actually had a degree in digital media and art and had a lot of experience in kind of video and, and design and, and art. And he, it took five years to come up with the, the design that I'm actually wearing right now. <laughs> and if anybody's watching this that fishes and hunts, you'll know this is a rather unconventional uh, pattern for camo. But the objective was to break up the silhouette versus match surroundings. And what it seems to have accomplished is that deer are not able to identify the hunter as a single solid object. So even when they see a hunter and see them up close, sometimes even standing in the open in the woods, they're not being alarmed because they're not putting it together. This deer focus on silhouettes. Uh, one of the wildlife biologists wrote that you know, a deer doesn't need to count the hairs on a mountain lion to know it's a mountain lion. They recognize silhouettes and they recognize our silhouette as being something large and potentially out of place and dangerous. So that's what really the inspiration came from. And we just had our first hunting season and the hunter's stories are just amazing. And I had a lot of people that used the camo come up to me at the NRA Great American Outdoor Show and they're telling me their stories of what they experienced. And I'll tell you what, it, if, if you try to rival what the story sounds like and compare it to fishing stories, but the challenge is I would look at them and say, you know what? Your story is completely true. I know it's true because everybody keeps telling me the same kind of story where, you know, deer are looking straight at them, not seeing them. I said, but for people that have been archery hunting for a long time, they think you're 100% full of shit. Just like, you know, when people talk, tell their fish stories and everything else. And um, it's kind of cool that they're having these types of experiences. The challenge is that it's a pretty unconventional camo. And, you know, people have to kind of adapt to the fact that we're not trying to match the surroundings. We're trying to break up the silhouette. And, you know, we've seen so many innovations in fishing types of lures. Now we have, you know, kind of live action sonar. We have much more sophisticated equipment. And, you know, I started fly fishing with a regular Fenwick fiberglass rod back in the day. Love that rod. Still have that rod. You know, then I went to a Fenwick graphite and then my dad actually custom built my brother and I uh, sage uh, fly rods and with and hardy reels. And that was a Christmas gift one year. It was a pretty nice Christmas gift. That's real nice. So, I, so, you know, my brother was a little stubborn and didn't want to give up his Fenwick that he had used all those years. And he wanted to keep his sage nice. And finally, uh, we, we, we camp up along Pine Creek up in like Humming County. And he finally pulled that sage out and cast it. He goes, I don't know what I was doing waiting for so long. As, you know, how, how much nicer it casts. So, so we've seen so many evolutions in how we fish. But if you really look at camo for the most part, 
I mean, when you look at like real tree and mossy oak and you see what everybody's wearing out there with leaves and branches, it's remained pretty much the same since Bill Jordan and them, them come out with it. So we are kind of a little bit um, revolutionary in terms of what we've done. And we didn't do it to be different. We did it because of the science of deer vision and it seems to have really paid off. Yeah, I, I think that's the key differentiator between like, people might look at it and be like, okay, oh, these guys are just trying to be different. They're trying to be flashy. It's just kind of a different camo. But it's funny when, you know, my sister just had a baby and when you when you go up to the baby, they can only kind of see the eyes and the mouth and you kind of yes. know that. So when yeah. you cover the eyes and the mouth, they think you disappear. Right. So <laughs> kind of the way I see like your camo is that's probably the same thing with the deer. So when they see yeah. a big blob, they're like, that's a human. But when they see your camo, it kind of separates it a little bit. They're like, I don't know what that is. Um, yeah. And we even have people that had experiences where they actually moved. Um, my buddy Barry kind of got caught um, in, his, in his saddle hunting off the side of a tree and his phone went off. <laughs> and uh, the doe looked up at him and he had to get his phone. And so he reached over, pulled his phone out of his pocket, turned it off, put it back in. And she didn't. She didn't blow her tail didn't go up. She didn't run. And then the buck came down the same trail while this doe was still looking his direction, but she couldn't figure him out. So he thought, man, I'm so screwed because now this doe is looking my direction. And there were three other doe with her. And he's like, I don't have a choice. So he reached down, got his crossbow, picked it up. The whole time this doe's watching and still couldn't apparently figure out that he what he was. Because we think that when they see like an arm move like this that they're not connecting it to a big body. They're thinking, could that be a bird, a squirrel? They don't know what's inside their head, but it's just almost unbelievable that he was able to pull off what he did. And by the way, he got that buck and it was the nicest buck of his life uh, in Schuylkill County. So he was really happy with that. But I've heard so many stories from hunters that use our camo. And, you know, it was kind of theoretical um, until this past hunting season when we had our first hunting season. You know, my son and I were hoping it was going to work as, as we thought it would, and it actually worked a whole lot better. So uh, we really enjoyed it. But, you know, hunters, I, I find that fishing, although you kind of stay with some of your tried and, tried and true patterns, fishermen are, you know, a, a lot more uh, adept to new types of lures, you know, willing to try anything new and give it a shot. And um, especially fly fishermen, you know, there's new patterns coming out all the time is, yeah, I'll try that and don't necessarily know what it looks like to a fish, but for some reason they, they like to use them. But hunters, um, whereas they'll change bows every three years, when it comes to something like camo, they really want to stick with what they've known uh, for a long time and have a hard time transitioning into thinking that something this different could actually work better than what they've been, what they've been wearing all along. Right. It's, it's hard to kind of break into that scene. I could only imagine like just trying to kind of educate the public about your brand and why it's different than, you know, the camo that the guy's been using for 40 years. Right. Yeah, I, I, you're exactly right. And I mean, me included, I mean, I used Mossy Oak Breakup and Realtree for as long as it's been out. And, you know, I switched to this. What was really cool is my son, Brandon designed this camo and he got a buck. He got an eight point buck this past year wearing the camo. And I, I actually asked our camo manufacturer, like, how many people do you think have designed camo and then actually killed a, a buck with their own camo? And she goes, well, it can't be any more than 300 because there's, oh, well, there's been total over the last 30 years, about 300 different patterns. So it's kind of cool to think that, you know, Brendan uh, designed the camo and then killed a buck wearing the camo he designed. So that's, that, that's kind of cool. I, it's, it's, it's a different kind of reward. You know, there's nothing like catching a, a, a trout on a fly you, you tie yourself. And um, although I don't mind catching them on, you know, I have to say dad spoiled us a little bit. He got into a fly tying fit and, uh, you know, not only, not only did he get us, uh, make us those rods one year, but then the following year, we got a Wheatley box filled with uh, dry flies. So <laughs> uh, he's, he's not able to do much tying anymore. He, 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 he'll be 81 this coming month. But um, so I'm more than happy to use some flies someone else ties as well. But there's definitely something rewarding about whether it's a fish or a deer, 
um, you know, being able to harvest something that you create and, and there's a special reward word in that. I know I, that Will Steinhauer who has the let's go fishing baits. I think it's just so awesome that when he sent me those pictures, he's catching these bass on baits he's molded and designed himself. I, I think that's so cool. And at, at 15 years old, and he's in the Harrisburg area, by the way. Nice. But, uh, and I, I mentioned we're going to have probably within the next few weeks, we're going to have his baits on our WTFcamo.com site. And he's young, does, doesn't really have the resources yet to, you know, have his own e-commerce site and pay the web fees and all that domain stuff. So we're just going to add a collection onto our website that's going to contain his baits and then he'll be fulfilling the orders for that. You got to admire someone who's 15 that's kind of starting their own little in the, in the garage type business to, um, and has that passion to make uh, plastic baits for, for bass and trout. So we're excited to kind of have him as one of our field reps for the camo. And then he's also a participant in our outdoor um, video production youth mentorship program. And that's something that your listeners might be interested in as well, because it's not exclusive to just hunting. Uh, we, my son, Brendan, again, who has that background, uh, we started an outdoor video production youth mentorship program. And like uh, Will does some hunting videos, but he does a lot of fishing videos. Uh, Hunter Hagen's one of our other uh, reps um, and, and participants. He does a lot of fishing videos and a lot of waterfowl hunting. So if there's anyone out there ages 13 through 18 that's into kind of filming their fishing adventures and doing self-filming, we're trying to help young people become um, ethical, responsible content creators using their own voice and not a char- not being a character, but learning how to um, how to express themselves and, and being the unique person that they are, and how that's a, the best way to get followers. So if anybody's interested, you can reach out reach out to us via our wtfcamo.com website and send us a message. And we'd be happy to get the, the, the youth involved in that, in that mentorship program. Yeah, Tim, I, that's an awesome thing you guys are doing. And if, you know, after this podcast, if you want to get my information, I'd love to get involved with that and help you guys out a little bit. Um, but that right there is kind of what it's all about. Um, whether it's hunting or fishing, just getting the youth involved, getting them out there, getting this whole age of social media can be like so confusing, right? For, for the youth. It, but it can't be. And, and, you know, one of the challenges is even on the professional shows that we see on the outdoor channel and such, there's a lot of people that you just know aren't exactly like that when they're in the cabin, <laughs> the way they are on the boat and how they act. And I mean, I understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. But what, what we're trying to help our, the youth participants in our program understand is that I tell them, I'd rather, I'd rather see you have 500 followers being you that have a thousand followers being a character because eventually people figure out that you're not authentic and you'll grow that 500 base being you. And, you know, even if whatever that version of you is, you might be really different than, than what else is out there, but I, I love different. I, I love people being um, taken advantage of what the aspects are of their personality and today's youth you know, I was a scout leader for 23 years and I was all about encouraging scouts and Brendan is an Eagle Scout and he's 35 now. I had to do the math real quick. He'll be 35 in June. But, you know, I've always uh, still impressed upon him how important it is that as an Eagle Scout, he continued to give back even, even before his daughters get involved in anything. So that's part of what he wanted to do through this program was really kind of give back and help uh develop and mentor youth uh, that, that want to be content creators and set up YouTube channels. And, and there's challenges with that because we're seeing some of our youth get their videos taken down by YouTube. And it's, it's, it's really frustrating um, in terms of they'll, they, they'll take down a video where they're duck hunting and claim it's dangerous, but yet you can see videos of kids, you know, in BMX biking and crashing and wiping out and, and such. So we're really trying to help them stay positive as well about uh, their content creation and what, what they're doing and, and just stick with getting it out there. Definitely. I think that's an awesome cause. And going back to um, someone making their own baits and catching their own fish on it. Um, I got a kind of cool story with that. I don't know if you know this, but I used to make my own swim baits um, oh, no, way back no. in the day. And I'll just be in the garage. My dad has a little wood shop and I used to make these, these ridiculous swim baits that were way too big to even be throwing for bass, but <laughs> just messing around with it, having a little fun. 
first ever bait I ever made. I threw it out there, middle of the lake. I'm like, well, let's just see how it swims. And I'm swimming it. And next thing you know, I look right underneath it and it's like a 40 inch muskie right underneath the bait. I didn't catch it, but even just to see, like it, yeah. it brought something like that to the boat. Yeah. I was like, oh, this, this is the coolest thing ever. Those are the things that get your heart pumping. And I, you know, the, when you can connect your own creativity uh, of something that you do um, to the field, and you know whether it's fly tying, molding your baits, um, you know designing designing a piece of clothing. Uh, one of our participants, um, she designed uh, she designs and makes uh, Christian themed outdoor clothing, and she started that in COVID. And she's also uh, 15. She might have tur- just turned 16, but um, you know it, it's neat what some of these young people are, are creating. And when when you can tie together your creativity, and the thing is is it doesn't have to be something like that, but you know, just to encourage any youth that participates in outdoor activities like hunting and fishing, to just you know participate in the creative process of that as well. Learn how to tie your knots, you know, get out, get out and practice, and 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 tie one fly and see what happens, you know, and and you get a mentor if if you don't do it with your new family, get a mentor that does tie flies and have them help you tie a few easy flies and even a little crest bug, little nymph things are so easy to tie just to experience what it's like to catch something uh, on on a, on something you made yourself. Definitely. And um, connection with family has always been a big thing with me and fishing. Um, How has this company brought you kind of closer to your son, maybe, and just kind of you two just kind of might be clashing heads at a few times, I'm sure through the entire process, but tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, he, he would probably laugh at when you first started asking that question. Um, I would have had him join me tonight, but they just had a baby, uh, their second baby a few weeks ago. So he's pretty tied up and getting a lot of sleepless nights with that. But, you know, the, the benefit of a father-son company is you, you have a lot of open communication. The drawback of a father-son company is you have a lot of open communication. And there were times in the creative process where I'd be like, nope, that's not what I want, you know, and, and but I couldn't. I couldn't describe to him exactly what I wanted. I just gave him parameters. And there were times where he got so frustrated with me, he actually literally did not work on it for like nine months at a time. And there was one time that I'm pretty sure was about a year gap. That's what it's a, It wasn't exactly five solid years he was working on it. It was five chronological years. But in the end, you know, we, we kind of pushed each other to the right direction. I mean, he designed everything. He designed the camo, he designed our logo, he designed our t-shirts, our hats. And, um, you know, I, I wouldn't have wanted it any other way. And having him come to the Henry Green American North Door Show and hear some of the feedback from hunters that have been using the camo he, he created, it was a pretty cool experience um, for him. So uh, it, it is neat having that father-son relationship. And, you know, there's, the money that's coming in right now on this kind of being reinvested back into the company. So, uh, you know, I figured out some different ways to kind of reward him a little bit. So he got a, um, a Raven crossbow this past year is kind of a little, little bonus. And then, uh, he really get in the waterfowl hunting. So he got a, uh, kind of a Remington V3 waterfowl gun, um, to hunt with. So, um, um, having a new baby, I know if I just gave him cash, I know it would go to diapers and formula. So I yeah. thought, okay, I'm going to get him something that's personally for him. So it's a little bit of a different arrangement when you don't have an employee and when it's your son, you can do things like that. You know, you don't have to cut a paycheck. You can say, all right, for everything you've been doing over the last year, here's a shotgun, <laughs> so, which no way makes up for the time he puts in, but hopefully over the long term, it'll, it'll, you know, it'll, we'll continue to grow. And uh, I mean, I have a full-time job. This is my part-time passion, I call it. So this is my kind of evening and weekend passion. So uh, it's going to, I'm going to just going to continue reinvesting in the company over the next five years and uh, hope to see just some ongoing growth. Cool. That's, that's awesome, man. And what I, Tim, what I like to do at the end of these podcasts, um, you know, I could talk to you for probably the next hour um, about different stuff like regional, regional um, you know, camo and how it differentiates from where we're at to some other place. Um, I'd love to get you on another episode, but sure. for now, um, at the end of this podcast, I'll just kind of let you kind of take the reins here, plug any website you want to. I know you got the baits um, coming on your website soon and then any social medias too you want to talk about too. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
You can find us on Facebook at WTF Camo. It's one nice thing about having that name. It's fairly memorable. And one of the things I would encourage you to do is when you go on my WTFCamo.com website, if you go to the page that's um, for supporting our youth and veterans, there's a couple causes on there, um, some of which are local. So the One Wish Foundation, uh, the One Wish Foundation provides outdoor opportunities to uh, youth that have chronic and life-altering conditions. And they're a remarkable organization and we're, we, we're proud to be a sponsor and they're having their banquet coming up May 13th. It's their 10th anniversary and it was so popular, I believe the tickets sold out in about a half an hour for close to, I think it's 400 plus people. So if you just um, go onto my website and check out the One Wish Foundation, uh, the other one is Riverhouse PA. There's a link on there. And Riverhouse, uh, I'm on the board and a volunteer, and we actually work with veterans and get them in the outdoors and try to help promote um, healing for veterans that have PTSD issues. And we work with a lot of veterans that came through the Lebanon VA. And we're not looking for money. We don't, we don't do expensive activities. We do hikes. We do um, take them paddling, biking. And, but, but the reason I'd like you to, to look at that if there's anybody out there that would like to come together and take some veterans fishing, uh, take an opportunity to put a fishing trip together for some of our veterans, we'd really appreciate that. And uh, it's something I probably just I could, couldn't do on my own um, solely. And um, so those, those are two uh, local organizations that I draw your attention to. And there's a couple other ones on there that you can take a look at, but uh, we always appreciate uh, reach, you know, providing support to some of those organizations that help others. And um, that, that, that's it. And you can see all the, you can see all the camo on the WTFcamo.com site, but I definitely encourage you to take a look on our kind of giving back page and uh, the One Wish Foundation. They've provided some amazing hunting and fishing opportunities for youth. And their long-term goal is to provide a One Wish ranch where they buy a couple hundred acres here in Pennsylvania and build some cabins and provide an area where they can have youth and their families go this kind of escape when they're dealing with the, uh, the chronic conditions that some of these kids face. And uh, it's, a, it's a great organization and, and uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. That's awesome, Tim. Um, yeah, I'll link all of them in the description and I appreciate you spending the time with me. Definitely want to get you on another podcast so we can talk a little bit more in depth about uh, your camo, kind of go from there. So I appreciate and, it. Yeah, and then we'll see what kind of fishing stories we have by then since everything's opening up soon. <laughs> yeah, you know. See how we're all making out. <laughs> you know. Cool, Tim. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Eric. Have a good one. Appreciate it. You just listened to the Fishing Fanatics podcast with your host, Eric Stewart. Feel free to check out our other podcasts and our other interviews on our channel, on Spotify, YouTube, and much more. Check out our Instagram page, TikTok, and Facebook as well.